Right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a talk on behalf of a silent minority, a minority that works in stochastic mechanics, but uh, I'm trying to make the minority more loud right now. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that most of the uh, symposium is in direction of deterministic continuum mechanics, uh, generalized uh, theories in, the, in, the, in that sense, uh, homogeneous media. Uh, what uh, some of us are very much interested in is generalization of... Uh, uh, mechanics of materials, mechanics of media in general to um, heterogeneous random media. Uh, it, the title of the paper is Tensor of Valued Random Fields, perhaps fractal character. Um, the uh, thing that I would like to point out is that for a mathematician, random fields is just a part of probability theory, but these are fields uh, of uh, R value type, of the scalar type. Um, uh, for people at this conference, uh, we talk about ten, uh, we, we use tensor fields all the time. Uh, so another way of putting the title uh, would be uh, random tensor fields. Um, uh, so in principle, what I'm looking at, uh, what I will be discussing to some extent, is a generalization of um, random scalar fields to tensor-valued fields. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of restrictions that mechanics imposes on such fields, um, let, I, I will start with. Uh, um, consideration of microstructures, say a Boolean model here uh, in A, uh, which I homogenize on some scale, and there's a whole issue of finite scale uh, uh, of, uh, of the upscaling. Um, so I have some mesoscale random field, and I go to macro scale. I have a macro scale continuum, uh, hopefully it's homogeneous. So uh, we have the issue of uh, statistical versus representative volume element, and um, the issue of separation of scales, the separation of the, um, is, is not generally um, true. Um, uh, so we uh, really have to deal with uh, stochastic fields um, of uh, various kinds of uh, type. Um, uh, one motivation here is uh, think of a wavefront in continuum mechanics, which is more or less a singular surface, classically. But uh, the fact is that um, this is in the setting of a homogeneous continuum, no microstructure. Uh, if I have a microstructure, I have to consider uh, the wavefront as a zone of finite thickness, which is uh, diffused uh, as it propagates over some grain structure. And uh, so this is the situation here in B. Um, if the uh, wavefront thickness is much larger than the grain size, uh, we go in the uh, direction uh, of uh, even uh, to figure A, uh, which, is, which indicates um, uh, the resonant volume element situation. But in general, we have to admit uh, wavefronts, especially shockwaves, are very thin, and therefore they feel the microstructure. If we do uh, even two experiments on nominally same um, uh, media, we have two, two different results. There is a scatter of results, say, of shock formation and so on. Um, so this is just motivation. Um, so uh, I'm working in the setting of uh, secondary tensor random fields. Uh, so this is kind of on the mesoscale, uh, which uh, where we see those clouds, which I indicated in the middle of uh, the previous figure. And... Um, uh, uh, more, more exactly in the setting of white sense homogeneous tensor random fields, uh, meaning that uh, the mean does not change, the mean is just constant in space, and the uh, collision function or the covariance function, if you get rid of the mean, is uh, only a function of the uh, spacing, of the spacing uh, vector between two points in the domain. Um, and the next thing that we'll be interested in is uh, isotropic type uh, random fields. Um, so there's two kinds of isotropy. In continuum mechanics, we, uh, of course, uh, have isotropy at the point. We have, uh, we, have, we have isotropy of stiffness tensor, of conductivity tensor, on and on, right, of all kinds of tensors. And uh, so this is classical stuff. But the second type of isotropy, which appears in, uh, probability, which appears in probability theory, is uh, statistically isotropic random fields, and so in my case would be in general tensor random fields. Um, uh, these are isotropies uh, for uh, correlation functions, which I just said a minute ago, are functions of uh, spacing of the distance vector between two points. Um, so the first one is the zero rank, 
This is the scalar random field. This again, something that's covered in uh, like five books right now, five books in probability theory. The second one is a vector random field. Um, the, the third one that I will discuss uh, to some extent is second rank. The fourth rank is stiffness tensor and so on. Um, Okay, so uh, when we talk about the first one, this is uh, very classical, scalar value uh, random field, statistical isotropic, uh, we have uh, the mean is just, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the, it's, it's, it's obvious the statement here, and the, um, the covariance function in general is a function of x and y, then it's a function of only of the spacing um, of, of the distance vector. Uh, we have a bunch of models, um, the whole menu of models, um, but uh, these models are limited in the sense that they do not separate local from long-range effects. Um, there's, however, development in probability theory uh, over the last two, two uh, decades um, it, for uh, introducing long-range uh, effects, perhaps even of the fractal type. So first I will show uh, two realizations or two cases, I mean realizations of two special um, models here, uh, Gaussian and exponential, uh, very classical models which are known for many, many decades, uh, which uh, do not separate um, the, and, and do not grasp any local effects. Um, any, any long-range effects, like extreme phenomena. Um, so this is a random function with exponential or Gaussian, um, I mean, random fields uh, in 2D, so on a 1,000 by 1,000 by, by 1, domain with uh, exponential collation function or with Gaussian collation function. Um, the fields themselves are Gaussian in character. Uh, they can be... Uh, modified into, um, say, log normal fields or something else by memoryless transformations. So these are transformations which are known in, uh, uh, for, for people working around the processes. Uh, however, um, ah, so here I'm showing those, uh, uh, this, this basic model. Okay. Uh, next I have uh, uh, random fields with fractal and Hurst effects. Uh, so the development uh, in the latter years of previous century was Cauchy correlation functions um, which uh, allow one to model fractal fields and this is shown here on the left uh, and even Hurst effects I will discuss, I will define Hurst in a second uh, the second one which was uh, developed just last decade um, is uh, here on the right and there's a so-called Dagon field and uh, here are the correlation functions unfortunately uh, so the bottom line is the parameters, the ranges of parameters which are allowable. They are not showing on the screen, um, the, the meaning uh, some bounds on alpha beta coefficients parameters. And the second one is a covariance function of uh, Dagon type, um, which depends on the spacing. Uh, uh, actually, the norm of the vector is isotropic, and uh, there's uh, ranges of parameters so for, bat for, for beta and gamma. Um, so, uh, like I uh, point out, and this is a really big advance in probability theory, these fields, scalar type, can grasp fractal and Hurst effects uh, in the sense that fractals are responsible for roughness, whereas Hurst effects uh, model heavy tail behavior of covariance functions. Uh, heavy tail behavior is extremely important to civil engineering people, geotechnical people, people working in the... Uh, catastrophes and reliability of structures. Why? Because this is the long tail of probability distribution, uh, probability density, if you, uh, which uh, is very difficult to model. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's responsible for uh, phenomena as follows. You have a flood uh, of uh, micro-micro type, say on the uh, uh, Nile River before they built the Aswan uh, Dam uh, 40 years ago, you, you have a flood almost every day, minimal uh, uh, elevations of water up and down, uh, minimal changes um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's some flood every year or so there's a bigger flood that you, we read about in newspapers um, every 10 years there's a really huge flood every 100 years there's a major flood which covers say, half the country 
of the whole country every 1,000 years. And there is a deluge which covers everything every 10,000 years. So beyond our measurements. Uh, this is an example of a Hearst phenomenon. That extreme events do happen. When they happen, they almost change the world. Uh, so, um, and of course, the same thing with continents. One has a one humongous continent, Eurasia with Africa combined, and there's two Americas. I mean, probability of one continent actually is very small, but it's, it's so huge that it's important, and so on. Uh, so, uh, on a phenomenological level, uh, I would say a few words here that a random process, say Z process, doesn't have to be complex values. I'm just using the letter Z. To, uh, because it wasn't used so far, is uh, self-similar in statistical sense if it obeys this law, uh, this equation, for some constant c, where h, the exponent, is known as the Hurst parameter. Uh, Hurst uh, effect is also sometimes called the Joseph effect, or even Bible effect, exactly for the reason which I mentioned uh, about the river. Um, the cruelly speaking, uh, when the process... So realization of the process um, taken from the ensemble is stretched by some factor c in the in x dimension. Z looks the same if stretched by c to minus h in the z dimension. Um, most time series, if you take a conventional random process, say if, from Einstein, Uhlenbeck, or Brian, uh, well, the, the, we, we want to talk about stationary. So Einstein, Uhlenbeck would be a good model. Look flat if stretched like this. Um, but uh, uh, now, fractals, these are nice uh, uh, enchanting objects. First effect, like I point out, is a long-term, me long-term memory um, uh, model which can grasp extreme events. Um, and there's uh, three cases of H. H can be either uh, between zero and one half. Uh, so thinking of a random process in time or a time series is a time series with negative autocorrelation negative in the sense that a decrease between values, two values um, uh, will likely be followed by an increase so uh, opposite, so this is uh, why it's negative uh, H uh, uh, can be between one half and one and increase is followed by another increase and uh, H is equal 0.5 through random walk just to get a feeling for what Hirsch effect does. So there's a, a range of things that one can do with uh, both fractal dimension and age, um, the Hirsch parameter, in, even in 1D. And um, uh, so we're talking here about multi-scale phenomena of random type. I'm frankly very skeptical when I hear uh, some claims about multi-scale models and I see no stochastic effects because multi-scale really uh, is uh, stochastic effect. Special case is deterministic multi-scale. Um, uh, here's uh, 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 j just a small menu of uh, realizations of a Cauchy-type random field. Um, and uh, I mean, the reason it's called Cauchy is because the covariance function has a form of Cauchy density, but it's covariance function itself. Uh, and this is Dagum. And uh, playing with two parameters, one can uh, uh, um, uh, represent uh, or get, simulate um, really nice looking, uh, realistically looking clouds uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the fractal type with first effects and so on. Actually, those previous two ones that I showed there. Uh, were really fractal and so on. So, so one can cover a range of different behaviors and of course making noise very weak one can go back to homogeneous fields back again. Uh, so now uh, the objective is to use those fields as models for um, uh, vector fields, for tensor fields and so on. And uh, so here's a condition uh, imposed on uh, uh, the uh, White sense, I said, on, on white sense, uh, uh, homogeneous uh, random field of vector type in order to make it uh, uh, isotropic in a statistical sense. And um, the famous example, classical example in this area is the turbulence field, so speaking, velocity field in turbulence theory. Uh, first, homogeneous. So we have covariance which depends only on the vector uh, from x1 to x2. And uh, isotropic. And basically, the isotropy here uh, of the vector field uh, is meant in the sense that covariance function is independent of rotations, while vectors at two positions are also being rotated by the same angle. So uh, if you think of two vectors, say a black vector and a black vector in the black coordinate system, I'm rotating into red coordinate system, and uh, I'm rotating by some angle, then probably distributions 
are unchanged by rotation, providing I also change the orientation of the vector. Uh, actually, this idea goes back to Kolmogorov and Yaglan. Um, of course, this is a very special type of a, a vector field, in this case, velocity field. Uh, of course, it was a canonical model of turbulence theory, as uh, elaborated in a classical little book by Bachelor. And, of course, uh, uh, sea surface uh, during a storm is near... Um, especially homogeneous norizotropic uh, is a famous picture uh, from the painting from about 300, 400 years ago in Japan uh, where the painter already had an idea of what turbulence is like, namely that it involves uh, vortices of all scales um, uh, right, we see uh, at, at least three scales this is Fuji uh, mountain, forget it but uh, here's uh, poor guys on this uh, boat, here's a major uh, huge uh, wave uh, shorter waves and uh, very short waves, and then there's a problem of resolution of the, of the uh, painter's uh, pen. Um, of course, it's not isotropic, uh, but here I had an idea also of a uh, Hirsch defect. <laughs> but ever so often there's a humongous wave uh, which you don't want to en uh, encounter. Um, uh, for second rank statistical isotropic uh, tensor random field, one has to follow in the same vein and impose a condition on uh, independence of uh, the mean uh, of a, a vector field and uh, the um, covariance function with respect to rotations which I just described earlier is getting uh, uh, quite formal. One can go by two paths. One is by uh, theory of invariance uh, for SO3 groups. Another one is by special basis um, in group theory. Um, a very special basis which I will not go into um, and so uh, in a way I'm recapping here in the middle that I have local isotropic tensor around the field so that's classical continuum mechanics uh, and statistical isotropic and uh, then one can ask an interesting question uh, can I have th this, this combination or, or that combination of uh, uh, say uh, of local isotropic field meaning pointwise isotropic uh, and statistical isotropic or uh, can I also have uh, local isotropic or anisotropic, but statistics itself is isotropic or anisotropic? If you think about it, really, four possibilities are there um, uh, here uh, in the table. Uh, however, with mechanics, one can exclude some possibilities. For example, having um, a random medium a linear elastic type with uh, the isotropy, meaning that I described the medium by Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, and now introducing randomness in space is a naive point of view, unless you say that uh, the medium has uh, piecewise constant realizations, but spatially uh, continuous realizations doesn't make sense from micromechanics point of view. Um, so uh, here's some history, restrictions on tensor random fields, um, uh, and I'm uh, distinguishing between two kinds of tensor fields, either those of dependent properties like displacement, velocity, deformation, rotation, stress, etc., etc., uh, dictated by continuum mechanics, or consistent responses, conductivity, stiffness, etc., which are dictated. Those restrictions are dictated by micromechanics. And there's a lot of uh, work done recently, a string of papers by uh, Suaz and uh, Guillemino in France. Um, so uh, it, now I will talk a little bit about representations of statistical isotropic tensor random fields, um, uh, which follows from theory of invariance or Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, but um, I just uh, give uh, key results here. So suppose I look at the simplest problem, what to me is the simplest problem of non-one-dimensional uh, continuum mechanics, meaning anti-plane elasticity. I'm uh, looking at this setup here, and by sigma naught, I indicate the fluctuation away from the mean. So I have the actual field minus the mean, I have sigma naught. I don't use prime because prime is reserved for something else. Uh, so we set up the covariance function of the um, stress tensor on the field. I have Sij, and uh, so this is the definition here, assuming the mean is zero. Um, the notation here should not be confused with... Uh, uh, the curvilinear coordinates with the one using curvilinear y. Because I'm uh, writing on purpose i on the bottom and j on top so as to tell me that i pertains to result at r, r plus r1 whereas j pertains to the event at uh, r1 position. And so this is very nice to distinguish things if one goes say to fourth rank tensor random field where I have 
one tensor CNR tensor there, and I'm correlating them. Um, now here's the classical representation, um, which uh, uh, involves two scalar functions. It's very interesting that local isotropy we know for second line tensor involves one function. Here is two scalar functions, A and R. Uh, now suppose. Uh, well, I'm saying uh, the stress field, stress field is subject to equilibrium, suppose this divergence free uh, field, um, this immediately implies this equation, which just by turning the crank implies this condition on two functions A and B. So this is the type of restriction that mechanics imposes if I'm talking about stress field. Um, and there's a, a transformation which one uses uh, in uh, fluid mechanics, uh, namely to work in terms of the f and g functions. Uh, the reason is that f and g functions have very clear meaning for experimenters uh, and uh, for experimentalists also in solid mechanics. Um, and uh, so uh, I will show this in a second. Uh, suppose I'm looking at the strain field. So here I have fluctuation epsilon naught. I'm interested in covariance of the fluctuations. I have the same representation from mathematics, but then I have this condition, compatibility in a way between strain and displacement, uh, which imposes uh, a condition on covariance function of strain vis-a-vis -vis covariance function of displacement field, U. So I'm going up to like capital letters to describe this. Um, and then just by turning the crank, one gets this, uh, this uh, restriction on the C and D functions, scale, two scalar functions. And so one can proceed in this fashion to say 3D conductivity and look at the uh, heat flux, which uh, we know satisfies the same equation as velocity field in incompressible fluid mechanics, and uh, they have uh, those restrictions. Uh, now this is for 3D conductivity. Um, uh, one has this, and here's f and g functions. Now let me show them uh, experimentally. Suppose you're making two measurements uh, by laser Doppler or something like that at two points. So here's the um, f function that uh, looks at uh, that catches the correlations between two velocity components correlated along the r vector that separates them. And here's normal. This u and this u is normal, and so. The whole statistical isotropic velocity field can be described in terms of those two uh, functions. If I have nice models that uh, can handle, uh, that can grasp fractal and Hirsch effects, I can simulate very quickly uh, fractal and Hirsch type velocity fields in turbulence. Um, so that's a combination of uh, uh, newer results in mathematics with uh, uh, fluid mechanics. And so one can go on with. Uh, a conductivity, like uh, one has to make various observations, like some symmetries here, just uh, following uh, uh, these basic properties and uh, get more results. Suppose I look at elasticity without really focusing on the nature of the C tensor, but uh, I would like to describe the covariance function of the stress field. So um, I have covariance of what? Of sigma ij at one point with sigma kl at another point. This is why I'm writing kl up, upstairs. And the representation um, of a second rank tensor random field is done in, in terms of a fourth rank uh, covariance function, which is deterministic by definition. Uh, and uh, this involves five functions. So that's a result that again is obtained by the uh, invariance uh, of group theory. Um, so there are those uh, five invariants, and one gets equilibrium equation, which then imposes some conditions on those five functions as alpha. The results, I, I will not go through results. There's too many equations presented uh, here all the time. So, um, And one can go in this fashion to covariance of strain field, except that one, I, that one has to look at um, uh, relation between strain and displacement field and so on it uh, uh, again leads to conclusions what are the uh, restrictions on the M functions there's five M functions for the second rank uh, field of strain and, uh, and so it goes so one can develop a, a sequence of models a series of models one can go with this to rotation tensor in classical continuum mechanics uh, I will skip that uh, one can go to curvature tensor by the same token. Uh, one can go to micropolar stress fields without saying whether material is elastic, viscoelastic, or anything. Uh, suppose I'm looking, so then I'm looking at two equilibrium equations, everybody knows it, in a static case. Um, 
I, this is dictated uh, just by this equation immediately. In the end, after several pages, one gets six conditions on ten functions. Why ten functions? Because I have five functions for the stress fields and uh, field, and five functions for the coupled stress field. And uh, by the same token, one can go to micropolar kinematic fields and get uh, further conditions. Uh, now for uh, three functions, uh, gamma, uh, u. Uh, is the gradient of displacement and the rotation field. And uh, so uh, I will um, arrive here at, uh, at uh, a few conclusions that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, those tens of random fields, of course, have to be subject to restrictions um, in terms of covariances. Uh, then one can readily simulate um, realizations of um, such fields which would have physical content otherwise uh, if they are not restricted properly by mechanics not, uh, uh, right, they are abstract constructs only um, for tensor type properties of materials um, meaning Hooke's law for example, I didn't even touch this topic uh, really didn't touch, uh, one has to go uh, I, in the sense of micro mechanics uh, so uh, set up um, a mesoscale, do Hill-Mandel condition, Dirichlet, Neumann estimates, and so on, and then one actually gets extremely interesting and counterintuitive results for uh, covariance functions of uh, stiffness tensor. If there's time in the break, I can discuss. Um, and so it has a number of applications, uh, cross collisions of fields, the classical and micropolar continuum. One can pull it further on, I think, uh, with just the future work. And stochastic finite element models where uh, one uh, should not just uh, assume something from the sky or by intuition and one should also recognize that if uh, we're setting up a finite element mesh with big finite elements here and small finite elements there there's a different random field which pertains to big elements, different random field which pertains to small elements uh, random fields uh, in, the, in physics have always been uh, defined in terms of resolution and that's something I have no time to discuss thank you Uh, which peak? Three, four. Three, four. Number three and four? Fifty-four. 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 Thirty-four. Okay. Thirty-four? This, this is thirty-four here. So these are consequences, yeah, before. I think we should, uh, we'll, we'll discuss in the break. Yeah. Okay. So the is that you are imposing a one configuration, uh, they are collision only obtained in the No, I, I assume that this relation holds for every omega realization of the random medium. It's yeah, the, so up there, I'm writing Hooke's law, but I'm not really using it. I'm looking here at the consequence of this equation at each and every point of a random medium, meaning ensemble-wise and realization-wise. Um, what, what, what does it imply for the covariance function? Right. So this is the implication. Um, and then, it's, there's some cut here, but how should one choose S functions, there's five functions, five scalar functions which describe a stress field. But, they are, but one cannot choose them like, like that. There's no complete freedom, there's a restriction. Yep. I just want to ask you uh, whether you think that uh, uh, these fields are 
just, uh, just it's important to be useful to, to introduce uh, correct parameters into theories with this regular chart. Or one can also think that to exploit the and probably the theory of uh, uh, stochastic partial differential equations to study the evolution of yes. the Yes. Especially if you think for application in the uh, uh, mediation or uh, fractal mechanics. Yes. So uh, in mathematics, there's work done on, say, on stochastic Helmholtz equation. And um, really, this equation only reflects spatial variability, random variability in index of refer in the in, in mass density. Um, uh, However, one should always specify what is the random field, what is microstructure sitting behind the particular assumption of that random field. Um, so, uh, this is the issue of statistical volume element. If I have elements which are very large, then uh, the noise is very weak, and I'm going towards the homogeneous continuum mechanics, deterministic parabolic equation, or Helmholtz equation, or field equation, right? Uh, if uh, you want to resolve something on the fine scales, seeing all the grain structure, then you have a highly variable field. So one should always specify this. Um, yeah. Okay, so 